met a guy by the name of Stephen. And uh, when we met, we started talking about um, the Lord and how good he's been to us. And when we finished talking, he wanted me to pray for him, so with him. So I prayed. And uh, another time we met, uh, same thing. We talked about the Lord, how good he was. And uh, when we were finished, uh, he wanted me to pray for him. So I prayed for him. Well, this morning, I saw him again, and we talked about the Lord. I was able to give him a pamphlet. He told me he knew Doug Batchelor, and he listened to him and really liked his story, and his story was sort of similar to Doug's. And he, uh, we kept talking and kept talking, and, and I told him, well, I got to get to going because I'm supposed to speak today. So he was like, oh, you're going to speak. Well, let me pray for you. <laughs> and so he prayed for me today, and uh, I just really appreciated that. Sometimes we don't know what, why things are happening the way they're happening, but God does. And uh, this story is really, uh, uh, well, you'll see. So why don't we pray, and then we'll begin. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for hearing our prayers and answering our prayers. Thank you for loving us more than we know. Thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. Help us to stay in your word so that we can be able to withstand those darts that the devil throws at us and we'll have that armor that you talk about in your word. Be with me now as I speak what you told me to speak and help us to listen, and allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. We ask all these blessings in Yeshua's most powerful and precious and holy name. Hallelujah. All right. If you go to a certain churches many years ago in certain sections of Eastern Europe, when you walk into the church, you would see this. An upright fish as the pulpit in the church. The insides of that upright fish would be hollowed out. At the base of that upright fish would be some stairs. Coming out of the mouth of that upright fish would be a podium. So that when it was time for the preaching of the word, after the choir sang, you would watch as the pastor who was called to preach the word would come to the base of that upright fish and would ascend the stairs through the belly of the fish. Then he would give the word or his assignment out of the mouth of the fish. Then he would, uh, and then he could now walk in his vocation which comes from the Latin word vocatio, so that he could walk in his calling. Parenthetically, to many of us have jobs and don't have vocations. That's another speech for another time. The image here that the architects and the church was trying to convey each time they worshiped was this is that sequentially you cannot walk in our calling until we first go through the belly of the fish so that interruptions precede assignments so that the act of this pastor going through the belly of the fish and then giving the word he was symbolically showing that before he could bless you he had to have personally gone through it himself. There was a great preacher who was asked about this young, charismatic, gifted preacher who could preach the birds out of the trees. So what 
do you think about this young preacher, the great preacher was asked. The preacher replied, he ain't been through nothing yet. He has not passed through the belly of his fish yet. We have been talking about interruptions here in Jonah chapters 1 and 2. What we have learned is that God's interruptions are tethered to his assignments. That oftentimes before we can walk into our calling, we have to first weather a storm. The problem with this generation is we want to get to where you are going quick and fast and in a hurry. You want to go ahead and walk in your assignment and walk in your vocation. But what you need to understand is you aren't ready to walk in your assignment or vocation until you have passed through your own proverbial belly of a fish. You need to go through something. When you bake a cake, it's, not, it's got butter, eggs, flour, sugar, and baking powder. Now, I don't just sit down and eat a stick of butter all by myself and then drink a raw egg all by itself. I don't chomp on some sugar and flour all by itself. No way. I don't want these ingredients raw. What I want to be done first is I need you to beat them up. I need you to mix them up. I need you to stir them up. Then I need you to apply some heat. The problem with many of us, I know you think you are fine and all that. I know you think you are gifted, but you aren't blessing people's lives because right now you are a raw stick of butter. God has got to let you go through something. God's got to let you be beat up. God's got to put some heat on you before he's ready to have you spit out onto dry land. Yeshua, on the night in which he was betrayed, the Bible says he took bread. Watch the sequence here. He blessed it, he broke it, then he gave it. One theologian said that what Yeshua does to the bread, he does to each of us. He takes us at salvation, he blesses us with with gifts. But before he can give us, he must first break us. We must pass through the belly of the fish. Come here, Joseph. When you read about Joseph in the Bible, he is an arrogant punk kid. Always bragging on his dreams. His brothers don't want to be around him. He's got nauseating pride. But when you see him at the end of the story, the whole world is flocking to him. He is humble. He doesn't harbor bitterness or unforgiveness. What changed him? God stuck him in an oven. He had to go through a pit. He had him go through Potiphar's wife. He had to go through some things. All I'm trying to say is there will be times in your life in which it will feel as if all hell has broken loose. You will go through crisis. You will grow, go through storms. You will be sitting in front of me with mask on, mad at others who don't wear one. You will go through interruptions and there will be times in your life where you will be tempted to be mad at God. But what I want you to see is this. When you think God is angry at you, you will find out that out of his sovereign grace, he is turning up the heat on your life so he can give you as a blessing to others. We don't walk in God's assignments without first of all going through something. You can't pass through the belly of the fish if you ain't been through something. You can't counsel me unless you've been through something. We must all go through something. 
This is the story of Jonah. God shows up in chapter 1, tells Jonah, here is your assignment. I want you to head due east to Nineveh. Jonah says, thanks, but no thanks. He heads due west to Tarshish. God then puts on his running shoes and he comes after Jonah. And, when, and we learn that grace is not letting you do you. Grace is not God letting you wallow in sin and not coming after you. Grace is coming after you and coming after you and coming after you. That's what he does in chapter 1. He comes after Jonah through the storm, through the lots, through having him thrown into the sea, through him being swallowed by a fish, keeping him in the belly of the fish, through the fish bidding him out on dry land, and finally, in chapter 2, Jonah is now in rehab. He's dealing with his idols, with his issues. It's painful, it's lonely. Now in chapter 3, look at verse 1. The Bible says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Let's stop right here for a moment. God could have looked at Jonah when he ran away in chapter 1. He could have said, that's okay, Jonah. You do you. I'll find someone else. If you check my resume, you'll find I've used bushes. I've used donkey. The sun doesn't just rise and set on you, Jonah. I can find someone or something else. God could have said, you have had your chance. I'm moving on. You failed your assignment. You have sinned against me. I'm done with you. But then in chapter 3, verse 1, he comes to Jonah a second time. Anybody here had God come to them a second time? A fifth time? A 33rd time? We serve a second time God. For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again, Proverbs 26, 16. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise his holy name. What we learn from this is that God's interruptions are not his eruptions. In other words, God inter interrupting us is not an outburst of anger from a petulant, punitive God. The very fact that God comes after Jonah again and again and again and gives him another chance shows us the patience of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise his holy name. So what we see in verse 1 is not a God of wrath, not a God of condemnation, we see a very patient God. Do you see that, church family? I want you to write down Exodus 34. And if you have some time this week, I want you to, in, to encourage you to read this chapter and marinate in his word. In Exodus 34, God and his servant Moses is having a conversation. God is not happy with what he sees. He has just delivered his people from bondage in Egypt. He opened up the Red Sea miraculously. They have walked through on dry land. He then closes up the Red Sea on their pursuers. He has miraculously set them free. How do they thank him? They wait until Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to have a talk with God. Then at the base of that mountain, they worship another God. God is shaking his head. Mm, mm, mm. Ain't this something? I deliver you and I rescue you and you're going to worship somebody else? So God and Moses have this exchange. God says, Moses, I'm going to wipe everybody out and I'm going to start over with you. Moses says, no, Lord, don't do that. You made a promise. 
Moses then comes back to God and they have this back and forth. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue, Moses says, show me your glory. God says to Moses, no one can see my face and live. But here is what I'm going to do for you, Moses, since you asked. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of a rock. <clears throat> then I'm going to pass by. Then all my glory is going to pass by you. However, I'm not going to let you see my face, just my exhaust. So here is Moses, 80-something years of age, hiding in the cleft of a rock, and God marches past Moses. Now the question on the table is, Moses, what did you see when God passed by? Look at it with me in your Bible or electronic device in Exodus 34, 6 through 7. That's Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. Moses, what did you see when God passed by you? I saw the patience of God. Now watch this. If you read your Bible, you will find that, state, that statement seven times in the Old Testament verbatim. Seven times the number of completion. It is as if God is saying to all the Old Testament authors, I want you to continually write down this statement of who I am. Why? because I want to seal it in the minds of the readers forever. I am patient. So let me read not all seven of them, just three of them. Look at Nehemiah 9.17. "'And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders, that thou didst among them, but hardened their nicks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsooketh them not. Psalms 103.8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Joel 2.13, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Now turn to, with me to Jonah 4, verse 2. That's Jonah 4, verse 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Is this sinking in, church family? God is patient. He is patient with his people. Patient in the Greek is macrothumos. It is a compound word. Macro meaning long or large and thumos meaning thermometer. It's the instrument in which we measure heat. So you could translate 
acrothermos to mean in English, long to anger. How is a person's patience tried? You only try a person's patience in your sin. In other words, if you really want to see the patience of God, God's patience is clearly seen, not when you dot all your I's and cross all your T's. It is only seen when you fall and go and get back up. You fall and get back up. You fall and get back up. And God never leaves. God is patient with me. Someone needs to hear that word today, that God is patient with me. Can you say these words with me? God is patient with me. Now, I really want you to get this, church family. Will you say it with me again? God is patient with me. Those of us who are parents remember when our kids were just learning how to walk. We got so excited when they would stand up and they would try to take a few steps and bam, they fell down. They are wobbling and we are telling them, come to daddy, come to mommy. They would stand up and try to walk with these cute little feet and chubby ankles and legs. Hurry, get the camera. We have got to document this. Before you could press record, bam, they hit the ground again. At no point do you go, idiot, dummy. No, you rush in and try to catch them before they fall, right? You pick them up. You hold them. You say, it's OK. It's OK. It's OK. You can do it. Let's try it again. Come on, come to daddy. Come on, come to mommy. One step, that's perfect. Keep coming. Two steps. Come on, come on. You are doing so well. Bam. Think about a few more years and you teach them to ride a bike. You were so convinced they were going to fall you made them wear a helmet, elbow pads, knee pads, and any other pad you could think of. Then you gave all the instruction you could, knowing they were going to fall. And when they fell, you didn't rush in in condemnation. How much more so God? For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. Proverbs 24, 16. How do we get back up, church family, after falling so many times? How do we get back up the patience and grace of God? Your sin does not surprise God. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows all the times we would fail him. Just think about that for a moment. Your fornication the other night didn't surprise him. There is nothing we do in our lives that occurs to God. Your porn addiction does not throw him off. Your gossiping, backbiting tongue, your divisive spirit, your slander, your greed, your faith in man more than in him, your slothfulness, bam, bam, bam. Bam, does not cause him to rush in in condemnation. He is patient with me. Jonah falls. The word of the Lord comes to him a second time. So that we learn that the patience of God is always tethered to his purpose. God is patient with Jonah because God does not just care for those people down the street around the corner, he also cares about his prophet Jonah. So what we learn in the previous speeches about Jonah is true. 
God doesn't just use people to accomplish tasks. He uses tasks to accomplish people. That there is a work that God is doing, not just for the people in Nineveh, but he wants to also do it in his prophet. But in order to do that work in his prophet, he has to be patient. So now he comes to Jonah a second time and he gives Jonah his assignment. And what we have discovered is for all of us in this room and those watching online, all of us leasing time on God's green earth. There is a call of God on your life. There is an assignment on your life. And God's call and assignment is so much more than making money. It is so much more than sending your kids to a certain kind of school. It is so much more than having kids. He has a call and, a, and an assignment on your life. That goes past jobs, retirement, paychecks, cars, electronics, houses, zip codes, homelessness. You were created by God in his image to give God glory. Now the question on the table is, how do I know what God's assignment is for my life? This text helps us. God comes to Jonah. He says, I've been patient with you. I'm coming back to you a second time, and here is your assignment. I want you again to make your way east. I want you to go after a group of spiritual runaways who are doing life on their own terms. Jonah, I want you to go to them and proclaim the word I am going to give you. And that word is a call to repent. In other words, Jonah, I want you to walk into that city to this group of spiritual runaways, this group of spiritual fugitives. Jonah, I want to use you as a vehicle for repentance, to turn them from doing them, to being followers of me. I'm going to use you to get these runaways. How do I know God's assignment for my life. Do you see the irony? God is using a runaway to get runaways. God says to a man who has been running away from him, I've interrupted you runaway. I've rerouted you to send you to go get runaways to reroute them back to me. My assignment on your life, church family, is going to be rooted in your struggle. Oftentimes our mess becomes our ministry. Our test becomes our testimony. Oftentimes our mess becomes the fertilizer God uses to grow us, which becomes the stage God uses in assigning us. So if you ever want to know what is my assignment, take inventory of your struggles. Anybody hear of this story called Come Fly With Me? It's a story about Frank Abagnale Jr., who was one of the biggest con men in the world. He conned banks out of millions of dollars, writing forged checks. He was the biggest fraud this country had ever known. He eventually gets caught and put in jail. Do you know what he's doing now? He's working for the government, helping them catch frauds. His mess became his ministry. I've met my share of social workers throughout my life who are passionate about restoring broken homes, who are passionate about coming alongside of kids who have been abused. And if you talk to some of them, many, not most, but some of them, they will tell you that their passion to restore and repair, repair broken homes was birthed out of the fact that they know the pain of what it is like to grow up in a broken home. 
their mess became their ministry. I know counselors who help people to navigate dysfunction and pain. Some of them got into helping others navigate dysfunction and pain because they knew what it was like to go through dysfunction and pain. They wanted answers, and in the process of getting answers for their own dysfunction and pain, the lights came on and they realized there is a calling here. I want to help others turn the lights on. Oftentimes our mess becomes our ministry, which means this, don't waste your pain. In the sovereignty of God, who oversees everything, there is not in, li in my life not one single solitary wasted experience. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That word all is a very interesting word, especially if you study it in the Greek. It's a very interesting study. It means all. God uses all things, our triumphs, our tragedies, our victories, and our defeats, our moments of walking in the spirit, and our moments of walking in the flesh. He uses all of those things. God can take your divorce. He can take your failures. God can take your adultery. He doesn't decree it. He doesn't want you to do it. But he can still take it and use it and get glory out of it. So that oftentimes we see that our assignments are rooted in our struggles. Sometimes we see that our assignments can be uncomfortable. Jonah 3, 2 to 4. God says to Jonah, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I was talking to my brother Paul Johnson about Jonah the other day. He told me, you know, why they listened to Jonah? He smelled like a fish. He stunk like a fish. And they worshipped a fish god. Little did Noah know, Jonah know, that, he smell, that his smell would attract the attention of an entire city because he stunk like a fish. You see, their God was Dagon, a creature, part man and part fish. God uses our mess for his ministry. Thank you, God. Notice the word begin in verse 4. That word began in Hebrew means to profane. It means to defile. It means to become common. Get the picture? Jonah is a Jew. God called him and assigned him to go into a Gentile city. If you know anything about Jews, God was very concerned about their ceremonial purity. He tells Jews not to mix with Gentiles. They were not to hang out with them. They were not to go into houses with them because it could compromise their ceremonial purity. In fact, if you read Acts chapter 10, Peter is staying at Simon the Tanner's house. Simon the Tanner is a Gentile working with dead animals. And while staying in this house, God gives Peter a vision. In this vision, he lays out some ribs and some chitlin. Anybody know chitlin? And all manner of unclean meats. And tells Peter, arise, slay, and eat. 
Peter says, no, no, I can't touch that. It's unclean. God says, Peter, I need to teach you a lesson about Gentiles. I love them too. And so should you. When we come to our text, for Jonah to carry out his assignment, walking into this Gentile city means he has to compromise his ceremonial purity, which means his very presence there is uncomfortable. Listen, church family, God has an assignment on your life. He has an assignment on my life. God's assignments are not a walk in the park. Some of you are waiting for God to do something new in your life. You want that new thing to be very comfortable. Some of you will settle for a mediocre life, mediocre life, because you are not willing to do hard things. You can see these people all the time, especially during this pandemic. You can't really put an age on it because they vary greatly, but they all have similar behaviors. Make good money, a good amount of money, clock in, clock out, got the house, got the SUV or muscle car, lovely family, things are going well, making lots of money. Even though they are making all this money, their soul is dying because they have a job and not a vocation. What happened is they went the money route, not the calling route. So there is no sense of fulfillment, no sense of happiness, none of that. I'm here to tell you, you can be as broke as broke can be, but if you are doing what God created you to do, you will be happy and joyful and fulfilled. You can be rich as the day is long, but if you are not walking in your calling, you are going to be miserable. You 20-somethings, do the hard things now. Get after it now. Do God's plan now. Follow his plan now. Do your began now. Don't trade your soul for the dollar. When God calls, there will be difficulty but you better answer the call. Oftentimes, your greatest place of sacrifice becomes your greatest place of satisfaction. You can't get to where God wants you to be unless you sacrifice. Jonah walks into Nineveh, only Jew in a Gentile city, one of the main cities of Assyria. If you know any about anything about the Assyrians, some of the most violent people ever, they came up with something called flame. They would take their enemies and skin them alive. They were the ones who came up with crucifixion. The Romans popular, popularized it. And here is what God says. Jonah, walk into their city and say, you all got 40 days to repent or your city will be destroyed. Now, if I'm Jonah, I would ask God, do I get an army to come with me? Will my boys back me up? God says, no, you're going by yourself. One Jew in a Gentile city of vicious people, a stinky one at that, violent nation, you got 40 days. God's assignments are risky. When God calls us into something, he always calls us into something that we don't have the capacity to feel on your own, the capacity to fulfill on your own. If you could do it on your own, you don't need God. And if you don't need God, it really ain't an assignment from God. When God calls, there is always a risk factor. There is always an element to it that is beyond your ability so that you have to lean into him by faith and trust him. 
And yet there is no faith unless there is risk. We can say all this faith stuff all we want, but if you ain't going to get out of the boat and take a risk, it ain't faith. The story is told of a world-famous tightrope walker. True story. Who stretched a rope from one side of Niagara Falls to the other. He stands on this tight rope in front of this big crowd. Who there believes that I can walk on this tight rope from one side of Niagara Falls to the other without falling off? The crowd responds, we believe, we believe. A few minutes later, he gets a wheelbarrow. He stands on that tightrope with the wheelbarrow and says, who here believes that I could walk this wheelbarrow from one side of Niagara Falls to the other without falling off? The crowd responds, we believe, we believe. He then says, who here believes I can take a person and put them inside this wheelbarrow and walk them to the other side of Niagara Falls on this tight rope without falling off. The crowd responds, we believe, we believe. He then says, who's getting in? No response. The crickets were quiet even. We read about people of great faith in the Bible. Woman of faith like Rahab. We go, we believe, we believe. We read about Daniel in the lion's den. We shout, we believe, we believe. We read about the Israelites up against the Red Sea. And by the time the Red Sea opens up, we say, we believe, we believe. We read about the three Hebrew boys that went into the fiery furnace and didn't get burned. And we say, we believe. We believe. God says, when you are going, when are you going to get in? I'm here to tell you today, we battle against the American idol of comfort. We churches are perpetrators to the crime. Are the seats comfortable enough for you? When you walked in, did people speak to you? Did your kids like church, children's church? Was the service too long? Was the air just perfect for you? Let me tell you, when God calls you, he does not call you to be comfortable. Where is the wise person? Where is the educated person? Where is the philosopher of our times? God has made the wisdom of the world foolish. The world did not know God through its own wisdom. So God chose to use the message that sounds foolish to save those who believe it. 1 Corinthians 1, 20 to 21. He hands you a wheelbarrow and says, get in. If it ain't risky, it ain't faith. What risk are you taking? Sitting at home with your mask on? What wheelbarrow have you jumped into lately? Or are you hiding behind the mask? Who does God say he's coming back for? Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And, and, and the faith of Yeshua. When the darkness is deepest, the light of a godlike character will shine the brightest. Acts of Apostle, page 43. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. Education, page 18. So the people of Nineveh believe God's message. So they decided that everyone should fast. And all the people from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth to show that they had repented. When the king of Nineveh heard about it, he got up from his throne, 
took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. He sent out a proclamation to the people of Nineveh. This is an order for the king, from the king and his officials. No one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle, and sheep are forbidden to eat or drink. All persons and animals must wear sackcloth. Everyone must pray earnestly to God and must give up his wicked behavior and his evil actions. Perhaps God will change his mind. Perhaps he will stop being angry and we will not die. God saw what they did. He saw that they had given up their wicked behavior. So he changed his mind and did not punish them as he had said he would. Jonah 3, 5 through 10. So church family, I have a few questions for you. Was it worth, worth the risk? Is it wor worth the risk to spread God's word now, right now, in this interruption we are in? When I spoke last time, I used I am that I am over and over. The response is, or the reason for that is, God, I am that I am that brought us out of the land of Egypt is the same God, I am that I am, that will bring us through this interruption that we are in right now. It is time to get in the wheelbarrow of his love and take the risk and spread his word. He then, he said to them, go, Isidore, go, church family, go, those who are watching online, throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to the whole human race. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Believers will be given the power. Who will be given the power? I really didn't hear you. <laughs> there we go. I heard you that time. Believers will be given the power to perform miracles. They will drive out demons in my name. They will speak in strange tongues. If they pick up snakes or drink any poison, they will not be harmed. They will place their hands on sick people who will get well. Those were the last words that Yeshua spoke before he went to heaven. The last words. Then he went to his father. Are you believers, church family? We believe. We believe. We believe. Who's getting in the wheelbarrow of his love? Guess it's me. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love, for being so patient with me, for being so patient with us. We need you. We can't do anything without you. We need your help. We need your help. We think it might be tough right now, but it's not but it will be tough. So we have to make right choices now so that when the hard choices come, it'll be easier to make the right choices. 
Forgive us, Lord, where we fail you. Forgive us, Lord, when we fall. Thank you, Lord, for picking us up. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us when we, will, when we don't deserve it. The devil tries to make us feel so guilty sometimes that we don't feel that we can even come to you to ask. But you said if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, we confess our sins. We're sorry for being pitiful, being judgmental, not being nice to each other. We apologize. Help us to focus on you. Stay in your word. Go, go, go and preach what you tell us to preach. And don't worry about anything after that. All he wants us to do is open our mouths and his Holy Spirit will do the rest. So help us, Lord. Help us to be bold enough to spread your word to others. We ask all these blessings in Yeshua's most powerful and precious and holy name. Hallelujah.